So welcome to another live installment of uh, Bio 320. This is the last day that I'm remote. Uh, next week I'll be in class to pick up where we leave off here today. So apologies again for not being there this week, but hopefully um, uh, these couple of classes are, are fine for you. So a few announcements before we get going. Reminder to get your text, Elements of Ecology, 8th edition. Um, uh, should be out there on Amazon, uh, in the bookstore, elsewhere, uh, usually for under $30. So please get a copy because, as you notice in the third bullet here, we've got homework due Tuesday, January 17th at 5 p.m. And that's an online homework. I think it's available now for you. Um, I'm actually giving this, doing this uh, lecture right now on Sunday before I leave, and hopefully by the time I show this on Thursday, I'll be able to come live uh, via Skype or FaceTime into the classroom. We'll see about that. Both the lecture from Tuesday and today's lecture should be online. Um, both the versions without narration, just the slide deck, uh, plus these narrated versions should be available uh, to you at this point. And finally, make sure you've got your clicker, make sure it's registered. As I said, we'll be testing those out a little later on, but uh, just make sure we, we get going on that so there aren't any problems or delays once we need those clickers for in-class quizzes. So before we get started on the lecture, I just wanted to start off with a bit of humor. Um, I'm a big fan of Colbert and Bill Maher, and uh, I always find little tidbits that relate to uh, ecology. In this case, a funny segment from Stephen Colbert. Uh, on Bobby Jindal, just because Bobby Jindal is a biology major, so since most of you, I think, in the class are biology majors, I, th shot, I, I thought I'd share this with you. And remember, I, I like to do a few of these, as I said, and sometimes uh, comedians make fun of, you know, liberals, conservatives, religious people, not religious people. The idea is not to offend anybody, it's just to use a bit of humor to get at issues that uh, we're touching upon throughout the course. So that's the way to take this, always with, uh, with a laugh. So here we go. A little bit of Colbert on biology. Folks, when it comes to 2016, I'm Jindal all the way. <laughs> Governor Bobby Jindal finished a strong fourth in this year's straw poll, and I'm not surprised. Jindal's a two-term governor of Louisiana, a champion of small business, and starting this year, he's allowed to stay out past 11 o'clock. <laughs> Now, unfortunately, unfortunately, Jindal's got a few skeletons in his closet. He's a Rhodes Scholar with a master's in political science from Oxford, and he ran the University of Louisiana system. He's an academic, or as one senior campaign strategist described him, no! and yeah, that's going to haunt him. That's going to haunt him. And last year, Jindal lectured the base about the GOP's electoral problems. We've got to stop insulting the intelligence of voters. We need to trust the smarts of the American people. We've got to stop being the stupid party. Well, I say, if being so stupid you can't complete a metaphor is wrong, then make lemonade. <laughs> and folks, pro Jindal's pro-knowledge agenda has hurt his popularity. In a recent CNN, ORC, WNBA poll <laughs> of New Hampshire Republicans, Jindal got only 3% of respondents tied with Rick Santorum and falling just short of no one at 4%. <laughs> which I say, folks, which I say he can use to his advantage. Jindal 2016, no one is more popular. <laughs> but recently, this man is going all the way. Jindal all the way. But recently, Jindal set out to convince people he's just a down-home guy who's learned to stop learning. Do you personally believe that the theory of evolution explains the presence of complex life on Earth? Look, the reality is I, I was not an evolutionary biologist. Yes, the reality is he was not an evolutionary biologist. He just graduated from Brown University with an honors degree in biology. <laughs> Come on! Nobody uses their college degree in real life. I mean, for Pete's sake, for Pete's sake, I went to Dartmouth, but I don't use my degree in diploma withheld due to outstanding library book. Can't get a job with that. And, true story, by the way. And Jindal knows what it's like to be handicapped with knowledge, so he wants to make sure others don't have to suffer the same fate. 
I want my kids to be taught about evolution in their schools. What I believe as a father and as a husband is that local schools should make decisions on how they teach. I think local school districts should make decisions about what should be taught in their classrooms. Exactly. Jindal believes evolution should be established science only on a local basis. I mean, take the Galapagos Islands. On one of them, the finches evolved longer beaks to punch holes in cactus fruit. On another island, the beaks were shorter because Jesus. <laughs> and Jindal, I gotta say, is off to an impressive retreat from knowledge. But there's a lot more science he could run away from. For example, he should insist that thunder is just God bowling. <laughs> and lightning is God getting his picture taken with his bowling trophy. <laughs> and yes, I realize lightning comes before the thunder, which would mean God got his trophy before playing his game. But you know what they say. God bowls in mysterious ways. <laughs> so I applaud Bobby Jindal for so deftly floating this presidential trial balloon. But please don't call it that, sir, because the science isn't in on ballooning yet. I mean, if hot air rises, how come hell is below us? <laughs> we'll be right back. All right. So, uh, just to get us started, to actually touching on a few things that will we'll be getting to in the course, evolution, the idea of what's, uh, what's uh, settled science, and of course, what you can do with your biology degree. And I hope all of you use yours. Um, so, uh, today I just want to start with something fairly basic. We are going to approach uh, ecology starting at the atmosphere. We're going to come down sort of at the large scale and work our way down. Um, we're going to go through a few of these fundamental style lectures they get at fundamental aspects of the entire sort of ecological system or, or ecological intellectual entity. Um, and today I'm going to discuss the Earth's atmosphere. So what you're seeing here is a plot of uh, radiation intensity here on the y-axis. And think of it as just the amount of energy um, coming down to the Earth um, from space. And then across the x-axis here is wavelength. So here are longer wavelengths down at this end, shorter wavelengths here over on the left. And what you see are three different bands of uh, radiation. On the left, the ultraviolet band, the shortest um, radiation coming in from the sun. In the middle, um, visible light, that is the light that our eyeballs use to sense things in the environment. And then finally on the right, the infrared band, very large, extending from uh, about 0.7 microns, that's the units here, that's micrometers in wavelengths, all the way out to 100. And this profile on the left in the blue line is the radiation hitting essentially the top of the Earth's atmosphere from the sun. Um, and then over on the right, this red kind of funny shaped uh, line represents the energy profile of energy going back to space from the Earth. And obviously, the sun um, is much hotter than the Earth, uh, a couple thousand degrees Fahrenheit. Um, its maximum wavelength is in the visible, no surprise there, although there's plenty of energy coming from the sun in the ultraviolet, and plenty of energy coming from the sun in what is referred to as the near-infrared, the portion of the infrared spectrum closest to the visible. But the Earth, being much cooler than the sun, emits out here with uh, a middle wavelength of around 10 microns, with a couple of these shoulder pieces uh, uh, to the lower wavelength side and the shorter wavelength side. But it's just an idea of the basic energetics of the Earth-Sun system, since the majority, almost near 100% amount of energy that the Earth's get comes from the Sun. Now, over in the ultraviolet region, that radiation is very dangerous. Uh, it has enough energy, at least some wavelengths do, to destroy DNA, and so this is radiation that most people think of kind of could, could cause cancer, very high energy, um, harms most molecules. Um, the middle, or, uh, middle portion, the visible light, um, is something that's hot enough to be white hot. Uh, the old incandescent light bulbs that most of you, uh, well, of course nowadays they're hard to find, but, but used to be the most common form of a light bulb, really is nothing more than a wire inside of an an evacuated glass bulb. You send a current through that wire because the wire has resistance to that current. It heats up and it finally gets hot enough 
to emit in the visible spectrum. It becomes quote unquote white hot. And indeed, you can, uh, in a fireplace or in, some, or in any uh, live combustion, though it's hard to get things white hot, um, things as they heat up will start to typically emit shorter and shorter wavelengths of radiation. <clears throat> and then, of course, over on the right are things like at seven microns, you know, an asphalt parking lot on a sunny day. So energetics in a spectrum, you and me, we emit everything uh, out there emits that has a temperature above absolute zero. So the walls, the floors, people, molecules in the atmosphere, everything emits radiation that is above absolute zero. And of course, on Earth, everything is above absolute zero and hence emits radiation. That radiation really is um, a function of its temperature. We tend to separate this broad uh, energetic spectrum into what's referred to as long wave and short wave ra uh, radiation, typically cut off around two to three microns. Everything to the um, shorter wavelength side of about that cutoff is considered short wave. Everything else is considered long wave radiation. <clears throat> so energy as it comes in from the sun gets parceled out into the earth system in a variety of different ways. Over on the left, um, I have incoming energy, and the units here are irrelevant. They're actually just um, not really units of, of energy per se. They're just a normalized unit um, noting 100 units of, let's say, energy coming into the system. And it's important to note that the Earth atmosphere system is in balance energetically with space. Now, most of you might be thinking, well, how can you have something like climate change where temperature is rising? That sort of implies that energy on Earth is going up. Um, Though climate change is true, the idea that the energy in the Earth system is increasing is not. All we're doing is adjusting how energy is expressed in the Earth system. Um, it's shifted over to an expression as temperature as opposed to something else. Um, but the amount of energy coming into the Earth and going out remains um, net zero and remains the same. Although there is a little bit of change in the sun's output, there are both cycles and the extremely long-term change in the sun is it actually turns into a red giant. Um, so it does change over time, but that is minuscule or so slow compared to the time scales we're gonna talk about as to be irrelevant. So energy coming in from the sun um, will be absorbed uh, directly by clouds and molecules in the atmosphere. Some of that will reflect light back out to space. In fact, about a third of that is reflected back out to space. Um, and the, uh, almost half gets down to the surface, where it is, again, absorbed into the surface Earth system, or, again, a small amount is reflected and added to the reflected amount from the atmosphere. That about 50% then gets put into all sorts of systems. It's, it's the energy that drives all the weather you see. It's the energy that drives all the life biology that we see on the planet, other than a very small amount. Um, driven uh, by other things down near uh, mid-Atlantic uh, ridges. But the vast majority of life is driven by the sun. It drives all the weather, and of course, all that ultimately finds its way back out to space through outgoing infrared or thermal energy. And it's re-radiated or radiated from a whole uh, variety of processes um, in the Earth system, many in the atmosphere, and many at the surface. So again, the energy balance of the system um, can be thought of as an incoming shortwave radiation, an outgoing longwave radiation. The system is in balance. That doesn't mean that you can't have a temperature rise within the system. But overall, the system's in imbalance and roughly not changing, at least in terms of the incoming uh, energy over time. Outgoing is changing its nature, that is, its spectral characteristic over time. And indeed, that change in spectral characteristics is signature uh, of, of climate change. Now, if we drop, dial down into this energetics a little bit more, these are just a series of bullets that highlight some of the key um, concepts associated with the energetic budget of the planet. Again, here is that spectrum. I've kind of compressed it and simplified it. This is then that shortwave radiation coming in from the sun right here. Here is the terrestrial outgoing radiation. And really what this is is almost kind of like an idealized version of the outgoing radiation. 
<coughs> excuse me. And as I said, it's important to remember that the energy in is the same as the energy out, that roughly half of the solar radiation coming in from the sun um, reaches the surface of the planet. It is that half of that radiation that drives most everything we see. Uh, the atmosphere is transparent to shortwave, that is that visible ultraviolet and a little bit of infrared passes through um, the, the, the atmosphere, but it absorbs a lot of long wave uh, radiation. And indeed, is that absorption of long wave radiation that is the greenhouse effect and climate change, and I'll discuss what the significance of the distinction between those is. Um, the atmosphere is heated from the bottom by long wave radiation, that amount that's hitting the surface. So the atmosphere, um, you can think of it as like a boiling pot of water. The, uh, it is heated from the bottom, not from the top, although there's a little bit of deposition of energy in the atmosphere. Most of it is deposited at the surface. And so the atmosphere being a fluid is like a pot of boiling water with the energy source actually at the bottom, even though radiation is coming in from the top. And then finally, the temperature of, of anything, anything above absolute zero, the temperature of something is really determined by the total energy and the, and the wavelengths of the energy emitted. F in this very simplified equation here, the Stefan Boltzmann equation, is uh, the amount of flux or energy coming off anything that's above absolute zero. It is a very strong nonlinear function of temperature. That is, that little increments in temperature lead to very large changes in the energy flux from, uh, from an object. And that the maximum wavelength, the frequency or the wavelength of the maximum energy, is also related to the temperature. So as I said previously, temperature is a key component in determining both the energy and the wavelength or spectral distribution um, of, of energy coming from an object. And all objects above absolute zero emit radiation and indeed absorb radiation as well. And without these gases in the atmosphere, and I'm going to go through the key ones here on the right, um, the Earth's temperature would basically be freezing. We're actually too far from the sun um, to have water in all three phases. What changes that is the greenhouse effect. Um, and the greenhouse effect is the series of gases in the Earth's atmosphere that essentially readjust some of the energetics such that the planet is a little bit warmer than it otherwise would be. Uh, uh, think of the moon, which is effectively almost the exact same distance from the sun as the Earth. The moon has little to almost no atmosphere on it, and it is extremely cold, uh, much, much colder than the Earth. And the only dis difference between the two, at least in terms of radiation energy, is the fact that the Earth has an atmosphere and the moon does not. The molecules that do this absorption of energy, this redistribution of energy on the planet, I've just put in a few. There are actually many, but these are the, the big ticket ones in the atmosphere, the ones that make all the difference. Water vapor, right here, is, is, a, is a very key and important molecule in the entire Earth system, but certainly in the atmosphere. And again, just to, um, this plot down here shows a little bit different from the one above. Again, this is wavelength on the x-axis, going from zero, essentially very, very short wavelength, all the way up to 25 microns. Um, and then the y-axis in this case, think of it as just from zero to 100%, the amount of absorptivity, the amount of absorption of the radiation at that wavelength. So you see here on water vapor that water vapor absorbs an awful lot of energy all the way across the spectrum. It has an opening or an area in the spectrum that it doesn't absorb a lot of energy. That's actually at 10 microns, which as I mentioned a minute ago, is about the middle point of the energy leaving the Earth. But it has lots of absorption of radiation, both over here in the um, visible portion of the spectrum that lines up with this incoming radiation up here but plenty in the near infrared and indeed some over in the far infrared as well. Above that is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide does not absorb much in that middle area except for a shoulder right here, very important shoulder. Um, lots of absorption all across the long uh, wave radiation component. 
and plenty of absorption both in the visible, a little bit in the visible, and in the near infrared. Oxygen and ozone, ozone is O3, absorbs right smack dab in that middle 10 micron portion, plenty over in the long wave, finally N2O, and methane. So these gases all absorb radiation in the Earth's atmosphere, and indeed, they are what keep the Earth above a temperature that would be probably inhospitable to life, uh, wouldn't allow water vapor to exist in anything but frozen form, and keeps the planet, um, again, in, in, a, in a much higher temperature state than it would without the atmosphere. Climate change, of course, is the increase in many of these gases. It is simply the natural greenhouse effect accelerated or, or added to in, in a very rapid and dramatic fashion. But it isn't conceptually or physically anything new to the system in the sense that the greenhouse effect has always been with us on Earth. It's just we are uh, intensifying it in a, in a non-natural and, and very, very rapid fashion. Okay, so if we were to look at the vertical structure of the atmosphere, think of a column of air going up from the surface, you know, up to almost to the point where you're hitting outer space, and this would be what the temperature profile looks like. So here again, we're looking at height over here now, physical height in the atmosphere. We're getting away from energy and just looking at a column of air, kilometers on the y-axis, and then temperature on the x-axis. This is zero C, we're in Celsius here, and going up to oh, 40, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So here's you know a hot day in Phoenix, it's way, it's way over here. Um, and zero degrees centigrade is right, <clears throat> is right there. And the lower part of the atmosphere, referred to as the troposphere, is the portion of the Earth's atmosphere where, where all the weather exists. Um, it is essentially defined by the temperature profile. And as you can see, I had mentioned uh, last slide that the atmosphere system is heated from the bottom, even though the radiation is coming from the top, but because the atmosphere is effectively transparent to that radiation, it passes through, it's absorbed at the Earth's surface, and that is where all the heating of, of the atmosphere occurs, with, again, one exception, which I'm going to point out in a minute. Um, that heating from the bottom means that as you go up in the atmosphere, the temperature typically goes down, reaches kind of a minimum point, where it turns over and begins to begins, excuse me, to increase again, um, and that increase is due to uh, the absorption of shortwave radiation, um, in fact, um, a portion of ultraviolet radiation, by uh, molecules of oxygen and, and ozone, and indeed, without this absorption of ultraviolet radiation by oxygen and ozone, we would um, be inundated with incre incredibly biologically damaging radiation. Um, but by doing so, that little bit of absorption, um, actually the atmosphere's temperature turns over and increases again because of the absorption of that, that, that energy. Now, it actually is not a tremendous amount of energy per se, but because there are very few molecules in the atmosphere, or at least less molecules as you go up, you get a, a dramatic temperature effect even though both the amount of energy and the amount of molecules absorbed in that energy are much, much less than near the surface. But that effectively defines the next layer in the atmosphere, the stratosphere. There are two other layers in the atmosphere. We don't think about them much, um, certainly within ecology and not even within atmospheric science, just because they're, they're very little mass. They don't have a big influence on what happens uh, at the surface of the Earth you're effectively running out of molecules and entering um, outer space in these areas. Um, excuse me. Um, so, period. The, uh, the top of the troposphere, the transition between the troposphere and the stratosphere is referred to as the tropopause. Um, it, in this diagram, is shown as sort of a strict lid. It's the height of the tropopause actually varies between the equator where it's a little bit higher and the poles where it's a little bit lower at, at the tropics, it's, um, oh, it can be 10 to 15 kilometers high in the poles. It can be anywhere from 5 to 10 kilometers, depending upon where you are. But again, it's defined by this turnover in, in temperature. 
Now the dynamics that are going on here, as I said, think of the atmosphere as a pot of boiling water. It's heated from the bottom, uh, and by heating it from the bottom, it is a liquid or it is a fluid. Excuse me, um, it's a gaseous fluid. Uh, that it has motion, and by heating from the bottom, it has lots of what is effectively like bubbling in a pot, or a boiling pot, if you will, of water. Um, that causes vertical or overturning motion in this bottom portion of the atmosphere. And also, by the way, most of the mass of the atmosphere is in this lower piece, because the density of the atmosphere decreases as you increase in height. Um, that's effectively due to the gravity of the planet. So most of the mass in the atmosphere is in the bottom. This heating from the bottom causes overturning motion, much like a pot of boiling water. However, the next portion of the atmosphere, the stratosphere, has primarily horizontal motion because it is effectively heated from the top. This absorption by oxygen and ozone causing this rise in the temperature puts kind of like a lid Anytime you've got a fluid that um, is warmer in the top than the bottom, because heat rises, you get stability. You get very little um, vertical motion. And the only motion you get, or the dominant motion in the stratosphere, is kind of a horizontal motion. Think of it like plates sliding over each other of air. Um, and it's all driven by the, the temperature profile. And of course, we know that overturning motion is driven by the fact that warm air rises, it expands, becomes less dense. Um, cold air sinks as it does so, it contracts as it hits um, denser and denser portions of the atmosphere. So those two layers are the most important and in many ways set the stage for what we then see on the surface of the planet as those energetics interact with the distribution of water and physical land on the surface of the planet. <clears throat> So uh, I want to describe the, something called the general circulation of motion uh, on the planet. Many of you have probably heard this before, um, so I'm going to move through it fairly quickly. But it's important because it gives us a clue as to um, some of the major themes of how biology is distributed around the planet. So imagine, let, we're going to start off very simple looking at the Earth. Think of it as simply a giant ball of water, and of course, since water occupies almost three quarters of the surface of the Earth, that's, that's in many ways predominantly true. But think of it as just simply a big ball of water. Um, imagine, for simple purposes, um, we're at, let's say, equinox, where the sun, its most intense point of radiation, is right smack dab uh, at zero degrees uh, latitude in the tropics. That's where the most intense radiation is coming in. Uh, and like that pot of boiling water, it is heating up the atmosphere from the bottom. Air rises. It's going to hit that tropopause, that kind of uh, lid where the temperature begins to change its, uh, its, um, its vertical profile and begins to move away from the tropics. It slowly cools, radiates to space, starts to get dense, and falls. And that cycle, that cell of motion, is referred to as the Hadley cell. And uh, the Hadley cell tends to have air uh, rising from the middle portion of the planet, where it's heated the greatest, due to the incident closeness and directionality of um, photons with the sun. And the air tends to fall somewhere 25, 30 degrees north and south latitude. Um, now that area in between 20 to 30 degrees north and south latitude is referred to as the intertropical convergence zone. And the name in some ways tells you a bit of what it is, convergence, convergence of air in this case at the surface of the planet. As the Hadley cell, as air rises, moves uh, uh, away from, from the tropics and cools, and falls at that 20 to 30, 25 to 30 degrees north and south latitude. It hits the surface with nowhere else left to go. It has to either go towards the tropics, towards the poles. And when you hit back uh, at the tropics again, you get this convergence. So this region is referred to broadly as the intertropical convergence zone because of this very broad, slow-moving air motion. Now, 
most of you, air motion that we all experience is local winds, typically. Um, the Hadley cell and the motions that I am describing, this general circulation of the planet, are not air motions that you would necessarily feel or, or kind of come into personal contact with. This is a very broad moving portion of the Earth's atmosphere and weather and local winds are superimposed upon this almost background river of air. But because of its volume, its magnitude, it is a, is a key component of moving energy around the planet. And indeed, it's transporting energy from a portion of the planet that effectively has too much energy from radiation and distributing it out to other portions of the planet. The oceans do the same thing, by the way. Now, we all know that the sun doesn't move, of course, relative to the planet. It's that we are um, rotated on our axis. That rotation as we move around the sun makes it look like the sun over the course of the year moves to the north and then moves to the south. So I'm kind of in this cartoon showing it as the sun moving up and down, but we all know it's because of the tilt of the Earth's axis. But as the seasons change and the effective point in, uh, in the atmosphere, the effective point of the sun moves, this entire circulation system moves with it. Okay, so the Hadley cell, its point at which air rises and the point at which air falls, kind of moves as an entire circulatory system with that maximum point. Of course, the point at which the, um, the sun hits the maximum latitude on the Earth's surface, 23 and a half degrees north latitude, and then uh, in the northern hemisphere's winter, it hits 23 and a half degrees south latitude. And as I said, that circulation pattern moves with it. I haven't talked about the two circulatory cells that are beyond the Hadley cell. They're called the feral cell and the polar cell. Um, they're important. They're a little less important than the Hadley, which is the most important just because of the magnitude of the energetics and the volume and magnitude of the air that moves with it. But there is also uh, a couple of circulation cells uh, at, at beyond the Hadley cell within the system. But we focus on the Hadley cell because of the energetics. Now, the other thing that goes on with um, the circulation cell, and I've noted it by the little l and the little h on this plot, <clears throat> and most of you have seen L and H from lows and highs uh, on weather maps or maybe um, watching weather news. And that is low pressure and high pressure. And low pressure occurs uh, at the base of the portion of rising air, that hottest point of the planet, typically uh, at the equator, but moving to 23 and a half degrees north and south. And that low pressure occurs because as air moves away from the surface, it leaves a very, very slight vacuum. That slight vacuum um, we think of as low pressure, low being low relative to the average. Similarly, as air moves down towards the surface, it causes a little bit of compression near the surface because of the falling air that creates somewhat high pressure compared to the average. Of course, here in the southwest, in Phoenix, we have predominantly high pressure, um, which keeps sort of a cloudless environment, um, dryness, relatively high temperatures, um, and so on. So there it is. Descending air um, leads to high pressure. Rising air leads to low pressure. And again, as that system moves, those lows and highs move with it. I don't think I was able to get the L's and H's to move with my cartoon a minute ago, but they, they move with um, that hot point and the descending air point. Um, if you look around the planet, uh, both in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, you will see that most of the deserts of the world coincide with that descending branch or descending point of the Hadley cell. Um, and as I said, it's because they are associated with falling air, it tends to be warm, tends to be dry, tends to be cloud free because it suppresses that overturning motion that causes cloudiness uh, and rainfall. And so if you look around the planet, you'll see all the deserts of the world essentially line up with some variation because of the geography of uh, the continents, but line up underneath the descending arm of the Hadley cell. Um, the, the southwest of North America is where we're located. 
is, is a perfect example of that. So I want to take a quick look at now let's drill in to uh, the and, and add water vapor moisture to this picture. And by the way, the circulation cell that I just described, the Hadley cell, which again, you can think of it as a pot of boiling water, where if you put a pot on the stove, you uh, heat it from the bottom, you'll have uh, the water at the bottom heating up, expanding, become less dense than the surrounding water. It rises, cools, um, gets denser, it flows out to the side, and creates this circulation cell. In fact, if you took a pot of boiling water and were able to get a Bunsen burner right in the center of that, you can actually create a perfect circulation system within that water. That cell, that circulatory cell, though I described it as a very large scale feature, it occurs at all scales. It occurs at smaller scales in the atmosphere. Um, circulation cells can be very small. They could be a kilometer or so in um, extent, not the Hadley cell, but the idea, the concept of local heating and local cooling can set up cells at all scales through the atmospheric system. The Hadley circulation cell being the largest example of that, but it occurs at all scales. So here we're kind of, um, this is actually almost not even relevant at what scale it is, but, it, but I'm looking at sort of a piece of the earth. You can think of this as the Hadley cell or a very small cell. But um, let's follow this motion now as we move around that circulation, but we're going to bring water vapor into the picture. And it complicates things in a significant but important way. As I said, as let's imagine some heating at the surface here over this uh, ball of water, um, we're now going to heat it up. That parcel or blob of air, let's think of it, begins to get warm, it begins to expand, it's probably full of water vapor since it's been sitting over the water, the water's been heated up and a lot of that water's been evaporating into this parcel of air. It's going to rise as it does so, it is next to air parcels that are of um, less density um, uh, and so that air parcel is actually going to expand. As it expands, it begins to cool off. Right? If you remember the old ideal gas law, as you compress a gas, it heats up. As you stretch out a gas, it cools down. As this parcel goes up, it is going to expand. It is going to cool as it does so. Um, it is going to hit a point where, as it expands, its temperature drops. It is going to hit a point at which all that water vapor in that parcel flips phase to liquid phase, and if there's enough of it, it will begin to lose that moisture out of that air parcel. Um, if it expands and cools enough, it will equilibrate with the surrounding air and stop its rise. Sometimes you can get a little additional, um, what's referred to as um, self-buoyancy, because as um, you probably all remember that in order to get water to change phase from liquid to gas, you have to inject a tremendous amount of energy into that parcel of air. Um, and likewise, when uh, uh, water vapor changes phase to liquid, it gives off energy. That's referred to as latent heat release. And so you can get additional self-buoyancy as that condensation occurs. You get some further injection of heat into an air parcel. That can cause a little more buoyancy. But imagine it hits that equilibration point. Um, it's now lost a lot of its water, it um, hits that tropopause, um, that compression causes a little bit of elevated high pressure uh, above uh, the atmosphere, I mean, excuse me, above the earth. It begins to then, as it hits that lid, flow sideways, it will continue to lose heat to space, and finally it'll get to a point where it becomes cold enough um, that it will then condense, get heavy compared to the surrounding air. Um, it's lost a lot of its water, and so now it is dry, it is cool, it is dense, it begins to fall. Uh, and as it falls, just like it did on the uprising side, in the opposite way, it gets compressed. It's now falling, surrounded by um, blobs of air that are of higher density. That starts to squeeze the air parcel 
in doing so, it warms up. As it warms up, it becomes, in a relative sense, even drier, because relative humidity, as I'm going to talk about a bit later, is measured against the um, absolute amount of water an air parcel can hold, can hold, which is a function of temperature. But in a relative sense, it gets much drier. It heats up. Finally, it hits the surface. That pressure causes a bit of high pressure at the surface and again um, cycles back to uh, the rising part of the cell. But of course, underneath this warm, dry, high pressure air are deserts. Uprising places with heating at the surface where there's a lot of moisture, you get lots of thunderstorms. Think of the tropics, right? So think of the deserts, think of the tropics. So wind, uh, now we're going to move off of that general circulation pattern just to think about what drives wind that most of us experience. And of course, you could ask yourself, what is the ultimate cause of wind? What is the force that gets it to go? And just like everything else on the planet, it is driven by the sun. That is the fundamental energy source that makes wind happen. More specifically, wind is driven by spatial differences in heating spatial differences in heating. And now let's return to this idea of a circulation cell. I'm going to use another common circulation cell, the land sea breeze, to illuminate or describe wind. But of course, what I'm going to describe is true in many different contexts all around the planet. In this case, the circulation cell is a local cell between the land and the ocean. Imagine you're on the Pacific coast in California. Many of you may be from California. I am. Um, and if you're, let's imagine you're at the beach, you all know that you show up uh, at the beach in the very early morning, let's say right as the sun rises, and you have predominantly offshore winds. Uh, winds tend to turn around uh, uh, typically in the afternoon. So imagine if, you're, uh, if you like to sail, uh, typically uh, in fair weather conditions, you would probably wait until the middle of the day, the afternoon, to go sailing. That's when the wind tends to pick up and become onshore. But when you show up in the very, very early morning, it tends to be light and offshore. And really, that is a manifestation of differential heating between the land and water. Um, during the day, when uh, radiation on land causes land to heat up faster than ocean. Remember water, most of you probably remember from basic science, water has very high heat capacity. It's hard to heat up. Once it is heated up, it um, tends to be stubborn in letting go of that energy. So it tends to be a very strong um, heat reservoir. Uh, land, on average, will tend to heat up faster and cool off faster than water. And so during the day, the land will heat up. Uh, just like with the Hadley cell, you'll get a little bit of um, air parcels that will heat and expand, they'll rise, they'll cool at some level in the atmosphere, <clears throat> flow out over the ocean, they'll cool a bit further, fall, and then make their way back to land in this circulatory cell. And so as you can see, during the day, the wind is coming onshore from the ocean to the land, driven by this differential heating, the fact that the land will heat up quicker than the ocean and start stimulate the circulatory system. At some point during the night, as the land cools off, it will begin to become colder than the ocean. The ocean is this big heat reservoir. It holds on to heat. Um, the land will let go of it quickly. And that circulation cell will reverse direction. And that's why when you show up at the beach in the early morning, you'll see typically offshore light wind conditions as that air flows off the land into the oceans. Um, in this case, the oceans are slightly warmer than the land. They're stimulating the uprising portion of that cell, and you get the reverse. That land-sea breeze, again, is what leads to those nice offshore winds in the morning. It gives waves the kind of uh, effect of blowing off the tops of waves, which if you're a surfer is nice. That tends to actually slow down the peaking crest of the wave. Um, that's why surfing in the early morning tends to be a little, a little nicer than later in the day. Um, and it it is a reminder that everything energetically within the Earth atmosphere system flows, quote unquote, down gradient. In other words, it goes from 
high pressure, high energy, to low pressure, low energy. And really this is, again, if you look at these arrows, they're always flowing from the high pressure point to the low pressure point. High pressure point to the low pressure point. And indeed, as you look around the planet, you look on a weather map um, where you see all the H's and L's, you look at the Hadley cell where I described the um, large scale high pressure and low pressure, air is always moving from the high to the low. And indeed, that is the predominant force behind all of the wind, be it at the local scale or the large scale. That differential high and low, of course, is driven by the differential heating all from the sun. So let's superimpose now one more aspect onto that simple picture that I've just described. Um, now here we're looking at just a little more elaborate version of that simple picture I showed you before. Um, and now I've tried to superimpose general wind directions as you see them on the planet. And again, here's our Hadley cell. Okay. Here is our Farrell cell. Uh, predominant heating is across the tropics, but that moves back and forth between 23 and half degrees north, 23 and half degrees south. Now, as you can see on this picture, as the air goes from the high pressure, that is the descending arm of the Hadley cell, to the rising portion of the Hadley cell, it's going from sort of roughly 30 degrees north towards the tropics. In the southern hemisphere, the same thing. Air is moving from about 23 and half degrees south latitude towards the tropics. And of course, that whole thing moves back and forth um, with the seasons and these areas of heating and areas of high pressure, low pressure and high pressure, will move with it. Now, as air rushes from the high pressure to low pressure over the surface of the Earth, it bends. And it bends due to a quote-unquote force, and I put that in quotes because it's not actually a real force. It's an artifact of the fact that the air is moving across a sphere, the surface of a sphere. This sets up what's referred to as the Coriolis effect, or Coriolis force, which is kind of a fictitious or artifactual force, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute, that causes air to bend. And the Coriolis force, um, the way to think about it is to go back in time. Um, there was a time at which uh, warfare uh, was carried out by, let's say, firing a cannonball uh, towards your enemy. And there was a point in history in which um, people were able to launch an object over the surface of the Earth um, at a sufficient distance to begin to see the Coriolis force in effect. And remember that the planet is spinning on an axis down the center. The distance from the axis to the surface of the planet is greatest at the equator. The distance from the axis as you move towards the poles becomes shorter and shorter and shorter. So imagine, if you will, if you're standing at the equator, the rotation, the, the surface land speed of the planet relative to space is the fastest, right? In 24 hours, that entire distance around the belly of the planet has to rotate one complete time. At the pole, it also rotates one complete time in 24 hours, but it's a much, 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 much shorter distance. Hence, the ground speed relative to space is very high. Here at, let's say, where we live, 30, 30, um, 3, 34 degrees north latitude, um, the ground speed is about 600 or so miles per hour. So right now, sitting in your chairs in this class, you are actually moving relative to space at 600 miles per hour. The equator, about 1,000 miles per hour. At the pole, very, very slow. In fact, if you stood directly on the pole, you would effectively rotate around some point right in front of you in 24 hours. You would be moving very, very, very slowly, again, compared to space. What that means is that an object that moves from the equator towards 
the pole, either pole, the ground speed underneath that object will dramatically change as the object moves through space. Now again, as I said, this was noticed at a certain point in time when people could launch an object over the surface of the planet uh, to such a distance that this force began to, 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 to be noticed. And the idea was that imagine you're, you know, let's say you're trying to launch a cannonball at somebody's city um, that's a sufficiently long distance away at a different latitude. Of course, if you do this along a latitude uh, line, this, it, the effect doesn't occur, but that you um, launch this object crossing latitude bands. The object will have the ground speed from, which, from the point at which it was launched. So if you launch it towards an area with a ground speed that's faster, the cannonball will appear to miss its target unless you compensate for the difference in land speed. So people noticed that they were missing their target uh, when they were launching these things across sufficiently long distances of latitude and had to compensate for the idea that the ground speed is different at different points on the planet. Um, that's where this name, the Coriolis force, came from. Again, it, it, it appears to be a force that bends or curves the object as it moves through space. Of course, nothing, the, a force is not occurring. All that's happening is the ground speed underneath that object um, is changing. And you probably all know this, um, it's referred to as the merry-go-round effect. You, you know this maybe when you were a kid. On a merry-go-round, you try to throw a ball to somebody, let's say you're at the center of merry-go-round, to somebody at the outer rim of the merry-go-round. And of course, when you throw it, because they're moving so quickly, the ball appears to bend and, and, and get to them far, far behind their location. Um, you have to compensate for that. Throw the ball effectively ahead of them in order for them to meet the ball when, when you throw it. And the same idea is occurring on the surface of the planet. Well, the same thing is happening to the wind. And so as wind moves from the, a high-speed location to a low-speed or a low-speed location to a high-speed, it effectively looks like it bends. And in the northern hemisphere, one rule, the, the thing to remember as a rule of thumb is that this bending tends to go to the right of the direction in which you are moving in the northern hemisphere and to the left of the direction you are moving in the southern hemisphere. Okay, And that gives you an idea of the bending of the air. Now, as you can see, in the northern hemisphere, as air bends to the right, in the southern hemisphere, as air bends to the left, it will collide at the intertropical convergence point um, again, in this idealized example, we're at the equinox, where the um, hottest point on the planet is right at the equator. It also will be diverging at the surface towards that high pressure. Imagine, again, the air is coming down in these high pressure zones, exiting to the north, exiting to the south in both of these high pressure belts, and moving away from that point, but converging at this uh, intertropical convergence point. Um, different names have been given to the different belts of wind around the planet that in many ways reflect some of the very, very basic dynamics that occur. And a lot of these names came from a time in which people were sailing large ships around the planet, you know, the um, 15th, 16th, 17th century when the way to move stuff around the planet was by a large sailing vessel and where people were beginning to move around the planet to larger and larger degrees or at least uh, sufficiently that they began to experience different large-scale wind patterns in different portions of the planet. And, um, and again, going back to the 15th, 16th century, um, the majority of the large-scale movement of people around the planet was from the kind of uh, European, uh, Western, Asian portion of the planet to the tropics, mainly to get resources and to return. Um, and so a lot of the names given to the broad patterns of wind are from that era and from the experiences. So for example, the trade winds, which are the winds in between the high pressure belts and the tropics, um, tend to be 
uh, trade. They were the winds that were used for trade because they were steady, good for sailing. Imagine you're leaving somewhere, at, let's say 40, 40, 45 degrees north latitude up here. You get into the trades. They're evenly moving. They tend to be blowing in the same direction. Um, good for sailing. You can kind of make your way across this portion of the planet rather quickly until you hit an area referred to as the doldrums. And the doldrum is where, doldrums is where the air is converging. Uh, it tends to not have a consistent direction because it's now effectively going up. And so it's poor for sailing. And in fact, to get from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere, or vice versa, um, was, was pretty difficult. You had to pass through this portion of the planet where the airs tended to stop moving laterally. They were mainly moving vertically, lots of thunderstorms, difficult for sailing. Everything slows down. And though you maybe very rapidly went from 30 degrees north latitude to just above the equator, it would take a long time to cross the equator and get into the other hemisphere. The other area that was difficult is this high pressure zone at, again, about 25, 30 degrees north latitude, <clears throat> excuse me, where the air is descending. And similarly, as, as with the equator, uh, difficult for sailing. These were referred to as the horse latitudes. Um, and typically, the biggest difficulty was, again, as I said, most of the motion, just because of the way the continents are laid out, and the, the, because of uh, the social evolution of human beings, a lot of the trade was occurring from Western Asia down into the tropics. A lot of boats moving down uh, into the tropical zone, coming back, typically collecting resources um, from those areas. Sugar trade being an almost classic example of that. Um, heading down was not so much of a problem. I'm going through the subtropical high pressure belt because you've just started. You've got plenty of water, plenty of provisions. Everything's looking good. You speed up. You get through the kind of low middle portion of the planet. You hit the doldrums. You slow down. Usually reach your destination, maybe north of the equator, south of the equator. Get your resources and head on the return journey. The subtropical high pressure belt was an area of, of the biggest trouble on the way back because typically it's at the end of your journey. You're running out of water, running out of food, referred to as the horse latitudes for an unfortunate reason because at this point, um, the first thing that went overboard to try to lighten the load and lessen the pressure on food resources were the horses um, and the, the car of the 16th century, the way that you got around on land. Hence, horses were always brought so that people could travel on land at the destination end. Um, they were often the first thing to go, so referred to as the horse latitudes. Now, you can superimpose what I have just told you. And again, everything I described up to this point was kind of describing the world as if it's a ball of water spinning on an axis, heated by the sun, that effectively moves back and forth from 23 and a half degrees north, 23 and a half degrees south on this annual seasonal cycle. We can now throw the continents into this picture and it alters things quite dramatically and in fact begins to start to look like the weather map that you all see or look at online um, that describes what goes on locally with weather. And again, we're looking at a map of the planet in January. And um, so here we are. The intertropical convergence zone uh, in January is south of the equator. Again, the, imagine, let me see if I can find it. There it is, 23 and a half degrees. Whoop, sorry. 23 and a half degrees south latitude. The black dashed line here is that intertropical convergence zone. And you'll see. First of all, it is not at exactly 23 and a half degrees. It's, um, some places it's very close, some places further away. What's happening is that this is an example of the differential heating between land and oceans. As you can see, it dips down towards that hottest point over portions of land and tends to look like it drags behind or uh, hasn't caught up with 23 and a half degrees south over the oceans. And remember that the motion, in this case in January, was just from the northern hemisphere to the south. 
Then it turns around February, March, April, and comes back up. So it has just left, in essence, let's say the tropics, and is moving towards this 23 and a half degree point. Over, and the reason, differential heating, it is hard, as I said, to heat up the oceans. And so that intertropical convergence zone, that is that point of greatest surface heating, tends to be lagged behind the point at which the sun is most intense on the planet. However, the pieces of land in the southern hemisphere, and of course there's far less in the southern hemisphere than in the northern hemisphere, is where that intertropical convergence zone is cl closest to the, uh, to the hottest point, or at least the most intense radiation point on the planet. And as you can see over the land areas, you have predominantly low pressure. Um, and of course, remember that low pressure, high pressure is in a relative sense. Um, relative to this low pressure over land, you have roughly high pressure over the ocean. Again, a little bit north of that most intense point, because again, air is converging at the intertropical convergence zone at the surface. It is rising, moving towards the poles at the top, and descending over these high pressure belts. But where that heating has bended over land, you have that low pressure point uh, coinciding with it. So you can see that what happens by including land and ocean, and by including it on the planet, not in a regularized pattern that goes from north to south, but in this kind of blotchy uh, pattern around the ball, you get not only the gradients north to south, but now you're getting pressure gradients from east to west. Okay, so you can think of that uh, here in the, in the winter hemisphere, you're going to get highs over land in your winter hemisphere, lows over land in your southern hemisphere, and a lot of this is driven by the fact that there's differential heating between land and ocean. Let's jump up to the winter hemisphere here. Um, so now we remember this is January in the north. We are now going to have um, the oceans relative to the land have held on to their heat a little bit longer. Hence, they have relatively low pressure compared to the land, which has now cooled off much more dramatically. It has relatively high pressure. Um, and then in the southern hemisphere, in this case, where the ITCZ is uh, at 23 and a half degrees south latitude, you get the exact opposite. And if we were to switch over to a July map, now we have the ITCZ in the northern hemisphere, you get the exact opposite. And because of the very different continental distribution in the northern hemisphere versus the south, and basically the difference is the northern hemisphere is dominated by land, um, you get a very different looking pattern, although the same idea with lows over the land, the ITCZ bending up at those portions over the continents, staying closer to the equator over the ocean. In these two cases, here we have the Pacific, the largest ocean on, on the planet, and the, and the Atlantic over here um, as the relative high pressure. And then again, the opposite pattern in the southern hemisphere with highs over the land, relative highs, and uh, relative lows o o over the ocean. So, um, and again, there's always a little bit of variation on this. It has a lot to do then further with things like topography, um, the orientation of continents, um, lots and lots of details I'm not touching on. I'm just trying to give you a, an idea of the general pattern, general circulatory pattern um, that we find uh, around the planet. And again, that sets us up for a little bit of the biology. Now, if we were to look at um, biological productivity on the planet, this is a map. This is derived from satellite remote sensing. I think this is MODIS in this case, probably. Um, this is net primary productivity, or the net amount of, uh, of growth, uh, um, photosynthetic growth uh, on the planet. Um, not surprisingly, you see uh, the greatest amount of growth uh, in the Equator, that's where it's both warm and moist, tends to be most favorable for growth. Here are your deserts, roughly 30 degrees north and south. You see Australia, Southern Africa, 
the deserts of South America lined up fairly well in the north and in the south. Now, again, they're not perfectly laid out at 23 and a half degrees, and that's because of that dragging of the ITCZ um, and the differential high and low pressure that you get because of the orientation of the continents. If we were to look at temperature, this is what it would look like. No surprise, it peels off pretty evenly um, latitudinally from the tropics to the north and south. Exceptions are due to things like orography. So, for example, mountain ranges in this case, uh, keeping things much cooler than they would be if we only knew about latitude. Big dramatic um, gradients over uh, mountainous regions, but by and large, it shows latitudinal gradient. We'll notice a little bit of almost a regularized tilt to the temperature gradient. In Asia, it's most noticeable um, at these low temperatures in North America and in Asia. That is due to the predominant westerly air motion in the Northern Hemisphere. <clears throat> which moves up and down with the Hadley cycle, but you have predominantly westerly flow, and what that does is it creates a halo of warming over land coming off the oceans. And you can see it quite clearly in the tilt of these isolines of temperature. Just a bit of halo of ocean, in this case the Pacific blowing into the North American continent, in this case the Atlantic blowing in to the Asian continent. Um, period. If you look at precipitation, uh, it's a little, uh, it's not as latitudinally regular as temperature, but it really shows up the presence of the desert regions of the world. And again, it's a combination of these two maps that give you primary productivity, give you the patterns we see. And again, primary productivity, the photosynthetic engine of the planet is at the base of the food chain, at least on land, um, certainly the base of the food chain on ocean, but the patterns there are very different. But on land, it's the base of the food chain. Hence, it really sets us up for all of the biological life and then the relationships that we're going to be exploring in the course. And hence, this is why it's so important to understand the basic energetics of the planet. Now, over long geologic timescales, there's been plenty of variability in the climate of the planet. And what I'm showing here is the very long uh, geologic timescale. Here is zero, where we are in the present time, going all the way back um, through, through time, um, all the way back to the Archean. And there have been plenty of shifts in the basic climate regime of the planet. Most of those are associated with major glacial events. And by the way, those are very regular, um, at this point, well understood um, um, periods of time that are driven by um, different aspects of, of the rotation and orientation of the planet with the sun that create these regularized points at which there's um, cooling versus warming. Uh, on top of all that, of course, at least at these scales, the continents are also moving around the planet. Um, and that's very important as we begin to interpret the distribution of life on the planet because both um, continents are moving around in relation to the energy coming into the system and the basic energetics of the system shift as well due to, again, um, perturb uh, small changes in the orbital mechanics um, between the planet and the sun. Um, you can also look and see, uh, or at least begin to tease out, some of these shifts in climate um, over his the historical past by actually looking at the vegetation itself. They can be used, at least over certain time scales, as a clue to what's gone on in terms of climate. Indeed, uh, for, uh, for trying to tease out the temperature record and conditions prior to the 150 year old modern recorded temperature record. Uh, we rely on a variety of indirect indicators of what the climate was, 
um, this is an example of simply one of them. This is a plot of pollen counts um, in, uh, this was a, a, a mud core from, from a bog in Minnesota. Um, you can look at the relative abundance through the layers of time in that bog between a series of dominant tree species and knowing the type of conditions those species favor, you can begin to interpret whether the climate was, was drier, colder, warmer, wetter, so on and so forth. Um, so you can use vegetation as, uh, uh, in, as a reflection of what climate was like in the past. And of course, vegetation itself, in addition to being impacted and affected by, by climate, um, it affects climate as well at certainly um, smaller scales. This is just an example of a simulation, uh, but it's calibrated to measurement over uh, uh, an area that is pasture versus an area that's uh, forested. And you're looking at three different indicators, evapotranspiration, which is the combination of physical mechanical evaporation and loss of water from the surface of leaves. Uh, this is the surface temperature, uh, the sort of skin or ground surface temperature of a pasture or forest system, and then this is the amount of rainfall. And you can see that um, over what is probably the scale of a few kilometers, that all three of these indicators are quite different if you're in the forest versus the pasture. And of course, this area shares the same climate. This is not at the scale large enough to have a completely different climate. These are over a few kilometers in which the general broad climate is the same, but that the microclimate or local climate between the forest and pasture are quite different. And that's not surprising probably to many of you. I mean, you can think of a microclimate um, right outside the door of this building. Uh, if you're in the shade, much cooler than the minute you go out into the sunshine, much warmer. Um, differences uh, in terms of vegetation, both because of their ability to um, move water into the atmosphere rapidly and both shading and a lot of other effects, they can have an effect on the local climate that can be quite profound. With that, I'm going to stop today's lecture. Um, I will be there next week. Thanks for listening in. I look forward to seeing you all. Uh, have a great weekend.